So I'd like to take a step back in time. In the days of the Mali Empire, there was a king, Magan Kunfata, who was known for his beauty across the land. While perched under a tree, he was approached by a hunter. The hunter had killed a deer not far from where they stood and offered a portion of the meat to the king. The hunter was a soothsayer, and so the king's griot offered him a place under the tree. The hunter shook 12 quarry shells in his hand and told the king that two strangers would enter his city with a woman who would not be beautiful, but would give him a son that would become a mighty ruler of Mali. The king took care of the hunter's words, as soothsayers can see far ahead. Years later, two young hunters were on the hunt after the great harvest. They had been told about a buffalo tormenting the kingdom of Doe. No hunter had been able to kill the buffalo, but the buffalo killed many hunters. The king of Doe offered a reward for the person who could kill it. So the two young hunters decided to test their fate. In their search, they came across an old woman. She was crying from her hunger, and the two hunters took pity, offering her some of their food. In her gratitude, she shared that she was the buffalo and that she would help the two hunters defeat her. The buffalo woman gave them two items, a staff that would weaken her enough for the hunter's arrows to hurt, and an egg, so that when she chased them into the dry plains, they only had to break the egg to summon a pool of mud to trap her. Her only condition was that when the king of Doe offered his reward, a choice of wife from his village, the two hunters must choose Songolun, the buffalo woman's daughter who lacked beauty. The two hunters followed the directions of the buffalo woman and returned to Mali with Songolun. They presented her to the king, Magun Kunfata, who then knew that the hunter's premonition had come true. He married Songolon, as the hunter had said, and she bore him a son, Sunjata, the lion child, and the greatest ruler Mali would see. Griots told this Mali epic of Sunjata for generations. Griots were the storytellers and historians of great kings and warriors. They were the pinnacle of West African civilization. Griots come from specific families and would give counsel to kings. They used the kora, a traditional instrument of West Africa, to tell these tales of victory, love, loss, and legacy. Epics such as Sunjata have helped generations of Africans know who they are. I am the daughter of an African-American mother and a Gambian father. My maternal side hails from Kings Mountain in North Carolina in the US. And my paternal side is of the Sierra and Fula tribe and fishermen by trade. When I was little, my father would tell me stories much like the griots of his home country. There was one he told me in particular about his grandfather. He had been biking down a path when he encountered little creatures, tiny men scurrying across the path. They're known as coos, tiny people who are not always visible. They carry gourds of gold and my great-grandfather tried to snatch one. Now, coups are also known to be very aggressive, especially when it comes to their gourds of gold. So you can imagine that encounter did not go well for him. But this story, much like the ones griots have told, mixes the fantastical with the lives of real people. And we don't consider these stories to just be silly tales. There's always a lesson to be learned. In this case, do not steal a coup's gourd of gold. In today's world, it's difficult to realize the importance of personal histories and storytelling. Griots are often perceived as relics of our ancient past, but I'd argue that griots and what they represent are even more important now. As someone representing two sides of a diaspora, I found that griots are a key to my past and my future. As African Americans, much of our history is scattered to the winds because of the traumatic experience of enslavement. To survive, we had to give up parts of ourselves that have felt impossible to regain. And this brings feelings of anger, sadness, and grief. But my current journey has brought me to a place where I can reconcile with that loss. 
I define a contemporary griot as everything a traditional griot is. A storyteller, historian, but in today's world, it means to record our people's stories and document our histories as they happen. As a contemporary griot, it's been a process of self-learning. About two years ago, I had the idea to start documenting my family's history. My mother's paternal side is full of self-appointed family historians. They saw the beautiful and painful parts of our family history and wanted to document it. These are my great-great-great-grandparents, Wesley and Naomi Mooney. Both were born into enslavement. Wesley was the grandson of an African woman who was given the name Sylvie and was taken from her home of what is now Guinea. And his grandfather was the enslaver who owned her. It was no love story, but rather one of the horrors of enslavement. Many African Americans can attribute their white lineage to white enslavers and men who assaulted enslaved women. It's already difficult for many of us to find out more about our family members because of the limited documentation of enslaved people. In databases with documents such as census and land ownership, enslaved people are listed as property and sometimes can only be identified by the gender written down. In some cases, the only way we can find out more about our family members is through the people who abuse them, tracing their surnames and ambiguous documents. This is the reality and after effects of a part of history that many people feel is distant from our present, and even when people feel is relevant only to America. But in my family's case, we have living relatives in this country because of the enslaver who assaulted Sylvie. Part of this work is navigating the generational trauma that is intrinsic to African Americans' experiences in America. I cannot do this without having to confront experiences like Sylvie's head on. And I refuse to define her life by what happened to her, but also recognize what others in my country won't. Now I'm sure there's a lot of discomfort about this, but it is my family's truth and that of many African-American families. And what I like to think is that past historians and my family worked hard to piece together our family history, despite how painful it is. And now their hard work sits in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., representing one of the oldest African-American family reunions in the country. So as African Americans, while what little we know about our past doesn't always give us hope for the future, it does inspire us to fight for a future that is better than our past. In the fall of 2020, I had the idea to start a podcast, affectionately known as the Grio Podcast. It was a passion project with the explicit purpose of documenting my older family members' personal histories. I wanted to document this because when they're gone, we've missed our chance to hear their stories and their voices. This is my grandmother, Sylvia Penny Ryder, uh, and the subject of my first episode. My grandmother was raised in the projects of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the US. Her father worked in the steel mills and her mother worked in the kitchen at Carnegie Mellon. Although my grandmother will be quick to tell you how her mother rose the ranks and became head nutritionist at Carnegie Mellon. My grandmother has three sisters and she grew up in Jim Crow America, going to all black schools until she was selected to integrate the local white high school. She was one of four African American students in a school where they were not really wanted. She went on to receive her college education from Cheney University, a historically black University and became a special education teacher before eventually becoming the youngest principal in the Philadelphia public school system at the time. Now, while usually griots tell the stories, I'd like my grandmother to speak for herself for a moment. And I think, if I can remember correctly, I was in the 10th grade and it was me, Eugene Epps, and Donna and Diana. They were twin sisters. I remember there were four of us, four blacks in the whole high school. It was so lonely. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it it was like we integrated it, but we and people weren't they were distant, but you didn't make long you didn't make any long life friends or anything. Mm -hmm. It's like they tolerated us. 
that experience of Swiss Roll is what made me decide that I was going to an all-black school. I've taken this 21st century approach to the role of a griot. Today's technology allows me to record audio and video, unlike my predecessors who often sat around a fire, singing the stories and histories of families from a memory. Unfortunately, I'm not that talented, so I've upgraded the role via my iPhone. I've been able to talk to family members and learn more about family stories and antidotes. I also use databases such as Ancestry to fill in any gaps in knowledge. Luckily, my mother's side of the family is very well documented, which is not common for an African-American family, but it did allow us to trace our family tree all the way to Sylvie, which is a direct connection to Africa. Now, the stories and histories that griots have been telling for thousands of years have had many purposes. One, to help us know who we are. People ask you all the time, who are you? but usually disguised in that typical slew of 20 questions. Where are you from? What do you do? But what they really want to know is who are you? But that can be a very difficult question. Half of my identity is built on this self-made, resilient, and strong culture built from the fractured pieces of the transatlantic slave trade. Out of our pain and attempts to hold on to parts of ourselves grew stories to fill in the holes in our history. African-American folklore is very much like the stories Griots told, and even like the ones my dad told me as a kid. There are stories about kingfishes, people who turn into owls at night, and black sirens that call our names from the ocean. When I was little, my grandmother gave me a book of African-American folklore. I'd read it all the time. I remember always rooting for the characters, hoping that they would escape their current conflict. And in every story was a lesson. And while I didn't read it for the lessons then, I understand them now. Storytelling can help guide us in our ongoing journey, to learn from the past mistakes of our ancestors, but also honor their lives at the same time. So how can we truly imagine a future if we don't know our past? Now, I, I'm no future teller, as that is not in the griot manual, but I have a better idea of where I want to go because of the people who came before me. Getting to know their lives has been the most gratifying experience because it gives something back. Learning about them has ingrained this belief that our futures are malleable to our imagination. My position now as a young black woman of African descent walking the halls of Oxford are my ancestors' wildest dreams something that they could only imagine, but doubted, would ever happen for someone who looked like us. And so that's why hearing their stories, their hopes, their dreams, their desires for the future of our family are so important. So all the years gone, while still lost, acknowledge the strength that I come from. My Gambian heritage has helped me to navigate my African-American identity. These two sides of myself have come together in this complementary partnership where I feel an obligation to not let our stories disappear, to ask about the difficult truths and the life experiences that no one asks about. This is my great-great-grandmother, Isabel Mooney. She married into the Mooney family to her husband, Sam, who she met at Lincoln Academy, a boarding school for African-American children in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Isabel was a teacher for local African-American children in the state. Now, I recently learned a story about Isabel, which I can thank my Aunt Alma for. A law was recently passed in the state of North Carolina, essentially saying that all children would be able to attend school, including African-American children. Now, Isabel shared this news with other African-American sharecroppers so that they knew that they had the right to send their children to school. So there was a young African-American boy named Johnny who worked on a farm for a white family. Isabel, being the very determined and, as others would describe her, feisty woman that she was, intended to go to this farm to tell them that Johnny would no longer be working there as he needed to attend school. Now, when Isabel arrived, they told her to go around back, as it was never allowed or acceptable for African-Americans to approach or enter the front door 
of a white home or white establishment. Isabel simply replied, I don't have time for that, and proceeded to tell the white man staring her down on his front porch that Johnny would not be working on his farm as he needed to attend school. Now prior to this, Isabel's one-room schoolhouse had been burned down twice by the Ku Klux Klan, but the family just rebuilt it every time. And so Grandma Isabel defied the KKK, knowing the consequences. And so what I think is that Isabel truly believed in the future of the children she taught and their right to pursue that future. And so that legacy has left this belief that the futures we imagine for ourselves and for others are not impossible. Being a griot is about looking at the past, present, and future. To look to the future, we have to acknowledge our past and honor our present. These continuums in space and time can serve us in remarkable ways if we can engage with them. My hope for this work is that it encourages others to do the same, to see that as young black folks, we can connect to our past. And although it will be difficult, and it may seem systemically impossible at times, those stories deserve to be heard. And so I stand here today as a product of pain, love, loss, and joy. And I live in a world that constantly reminds me what my ancestors endured, but also survived. And so on the days when I doubt the certainty of our future, I remember who and where I come from, the figurative and physical places that my family has called home. And I realized that while my future, our future, may not be set in stone, my ancestors' imaginations got me this far, so I can only imagine where the future will take me next. So I, as a descendant of enslaved people, of generations of teachers, and of the Sierra and Fula tribe, try to honor my ancestors at every step and continue to share their stories and their lessons with the world. Thank you.